On October 1st, earlier this year, I stood at the ceiling of Africa, the tallest point on the continent, on the top of Kilimanjaro. Um, it took two years of planning, lots of training, uh, 40 hours of flying, and five days to hike to almost 20,000 feet above sea level, almost 6,000 uh, meters. Along the way, um, it was the hardest physical challenge that I've ever had in my whole life so far. Um, and I, I want to show you some photos from the top. I, these are just some photos of us trekking along. This is a photo of the sunrise. We were up so high on Kilimanjaro on the last night, or the last morning when the sun rose, we could see the curve of the earth on the horizon. Um, this is us after the sun rose. Uh, and then eventually we made it to the top. This is my friend and I that came with me um, at the top of Kilimanjaro. We spent about a half hour up there uh, and celebrating, taking pictures, congratulating each other. And then we started down. And when we started down, that's when the drama set in. Uh, because I suddenly couldn't take more than a few steps without having, st uh, having to stop to take my breath. I would take a few more steps and I would have to stop again. And along this way, I started developing a really bad cough, right? And so um, I would take my steps, I would cough, I, and I thought it was just from the altitude, from the dust, I, and having a hard time breathing. Our guide noticed what was going on, um, and he knew that I was actually having a pulmonary edema. Uh, and basically that means that my lungs were filling with fluid, and we were still about 19,000 feet above sea level. Uh, and so our guide got our crew jump into gear and our crew, two of our crew hoisted me onto their backs and ran me down to our height and to our the camp where we'd spent the night before on their backs um on my uh, me on their backs uh down almost a thousand feet down a very steep and slippery scree field um where i waited um where where i where i uh, collapsed into a waiting chair and while I was sitting there in the chair, I was hyperventilating, I felt very dizzy, and uh, our guide came into the, into the tent where I was, and he put a little machine that clips to the end of your finger that measures the oxygen level in your blood. The level, uh, the level between good and bad on this machine is 50. I dropped to a 36. The human brain needs at least a 25 to continue functioning, so I was definitely not doing very well. Uh, he asked me to lay down in the tent and tell him what I felt. I lay down, I immediately felt this lightning bolt of pain start here and shoot up and shoot down all at the same time. I told him what I felt and within two minutes of that he had organized the evacuation. Um, I don't have any photos of the evacuation because it all happened very fast. Uh, but what, what did happen was uh, seven of our crew alternated carrying me on their backs uh, up boulders down through valleys across all kinds of terrain for an hour and they were running and i am 190 pounds and that's not easy to run with uh, and so we got to after an hour we got to a stretcher that was waiting um, it was an all-terrain stretcher they strapped me in and these seven guys ran with me ran for three and a half hours for me to get to the lowest camp where a car eventually came and picked me up. Along the way, I remember I, I, some of, uh, one of the things that I remember uh, was watching the sunset behind this very, very dramatic peak. And I remember thinking, that is so beautiful and I feel so bad that these guys are running with me strapped into a stretcher instead of watching this uh, sunset. And I told him this, and one of the guys said, we can't believe that you flew all the way from Guatemala just to be with us. You're our brother. And this is what we do for our brothers, right? Another guy gave me the hat off of his head. And by, when we got to the lowest camp, I could actually take a couple deep breaths again. And they unstrapped me, and I asked them what they were doing, and they took off back, hiking back to the highest camp for four and a half hours through the dark and freezing cold with just their little headlamps on. 
So that was all very dramatic. And what I had and, and I haven't included one detail yet. Um, and that was 24 years ago. I was told that I was going blind. I, I've been legally blind uh, since 2012. And uh, and so and so I've been legally blind since 2012. Um, basically what that means is I can see 25% of what you can see, of what a normal person can see, a person with normal eyes uh, can see out of my good eye with my contact lenses in. So even with my corrected vision, I can only see 25% of what you can see. Legally, uh, legal blindness is a tricky thing because sometimes people think that I'm faking, right? Because they see me walking around the streets here in Antigua, wherever. They see me walking around the streets. They see me on the side of a gigantic mountain and they think this guy's faking. He can see, otherwise he couldn't do this. Um, and uh, the reality is, is that when I was standing here getting ready to go up on stage, I was totally zoned in on those steps because I was completely afraid that I was going to trip up those steps and, I, and you were all going to see me fall, right? Um, I didn't want to give anything away, so I was very concentrated on the steps. Uh, but um, people do think that I'm faking. Uh, and here, I want to show you a picture of Antigua, uh, just a normal Antigua street. On one side is what you may see as you're walking down the street. Next to it is what I see. Uh, for a, as you can see, there's a little clear spot. Um, but most of the time when I'm walking around during the day, like right now, it's like walking around in a very thick fog, right? I, every, I, my vision is, uh, my eyesight is cloudy. Uh, 24, uh, well, whenever I'm awake, it's like walking in, in, in a thick fog. Here's a uh, street scene at night, uh, again in Antigua. Again, on one side is what you may see as you're walking down the street. Next to that is what I can't see. <laughs> uh, and what uh, what I can't see is anything except for headlights and a few streetlights, right? And so, um, and so, hey, being legally blind is really just a challenge. It's 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 my challenge, uh, but it's not my definition. Like the video before, my challenge does not define me. And to me, the challenge, uh, whatever challenges we have, just bring up creative solutions. I love to hike, and I love to be outdoors. I go crazy if I have to stay inside for a whole day. And so I wanted to keep hiking. I wanted to stay outside. And so a few years ago here in Guatemala, me and some friends decided that we were going to start this project that we call Climbing Blind. Uh, Climbing Blind is, is, uh, is our effort to raise money for research into rare blindness diseases. Uh, and how would we raise that money is we go out and we hike as many volcanoes as we can. Uh, and to, uh, to date, we've raised over five thousand dollars to donate uh, that we've donated to different foundations that are supporting the doctors and the scientists that are looking for cures to to these uh, rare blindness diseases. On our first climb, uh, we went big. We we didn't want to do anything halfway, so we went for Akatenango. Here we are at the top of Akatenango. Anybody who's been on this hike before or who has heard of it uh, knows that it's an overnight hike and you, you, you camp up near the top and then you leave for the summit the next morning at 4 a.m. My friend Dave, who's, uh, who's one of the four in this picture with us, uh, what, he, what our creative solution was so that I could get to the top was he took a long stick and he tied a flashlight to the end of the stick and dragged it behind him and I followed that little light through the rocks and up the path and until the sun came up. And then, as you can see here, we made it to the top. In December of 2016, we uh, went for another big one. We went for Tahumuco, which is the highest point in Central America at about 4,000 meters, 16,000 feet. Uh, and on this one, here I am at the top of Tahumuco. 
for this one, we left at four o'clock in the morning again. And my wife uh, wore very bright shoes. And so I could follow in her steps the whole time that she was walking because she had on bright neon shoes. Behind me was, uh, was another friend of ours that was helping steady me so that I wouldn't fall off a rock or fall down a cliff. Um, and we made it to the top. All of us made it to the top. Going back to Kilimanjaro real quickly, uh, we went for the, for the summit on that one. Again, we left our camp at four o'clock in the morning, about two and a half, uh, about two hours before sunrise. So we were hiking for a long time in the dark. Our solution to this one was that our crew took a silver emergency blanket that I had in my backpack, cut it up, tied it to their legs so that I could follow their steps with my little headlamp uh, through the dark of the night. Again, over huge rocks, down through valleys, and across all kinds of terrain. And so, to me, having having been diagnosed, uh, having been uh, legally blind now for six years, I've had a big learning curve, right? Uh, and I was first diagnosed when I was 19 years old. I was fiercely independent, and through all this time, the learning curve has been about helping. I've had to learn how to ask for help. I've had to realize when I need to ask for help. I've had to learn that uh, when people offer help, it's not because they pity me. It's not because they feel bad for me. It's because they're concerned for me. Um, and that, and that asking for help is not is not is not admitting defeat. Asking for help is just saying, I need a hand doing this because I need to do it in a little separate way. With all the examples that I gave on our volcano hikes, uh, those were all pretty extreme examples, right? I don't expect any everybody to go out and start climbing volcanoes to see where you need help. That's not the point. The point is that we have to ask. For, we have to be able to ask for help. We have to be comfortable asking for help with ourselves and not feel too proud in order to ask for help. Again, we're not admitting defeat. We're just saying we need to do something in a slightly different way. Another, uh, and, and so I've been married for two and a half years. My wife, Alejandra, also had a very, very big learning curve. I am the first blind person that she has ever been with. And this was something completely new to her, completely new to, uh, to her whole family. Um, through, through the time that we've been together, she's learned how to read where I need help. And, all, and, and she makes the small gestures to help every single day. And often it's the smallest gestures that mean the most, right? Um, again, the examples on the volcanoes were extreme. The smallest gestures, like in the morning, uh, we have yo when we have yogurt and granola, she takes the yogurt and pours it into my bowl because the bowl is the same color as the tablecloth. And I know from experience that that yogurt goes everywhere if it's not in the bowl. And so she pours the yogurt on my granola in the morning. A very small gesture. It means the world. When we're watching TV, when we're watching a movie, she just automatically turns up the brightness all the way on the screen, not because she needs it, but because I can't see anything unless that brightness is all the way up. When we're in, uh, when we're in line at a buffet, at a wedding, she, I hold my plate out, she tells me what the food is, I tell her if I want it or not, and she puts it on my plate. Because otherwise I couldn't eat, because I can't see the spoons, I can't see what, uh, what the food is, I can't help myself, I have to ask for help. It's not because I want a servant, it's because I can't do it, I need a little help. And that's not a problem, but I've had to learn that. I've had to learn not to feel too proud to not eat, but instead to stand there and let somebody help me do it. When you're walking along, I can only speak for blind people. Um, but there are a lot. There are things that you can do 
when you see somebody struggling, right? And we see this all the time, and we struggle with different things. We're human, we can't do everything by ourselves. We all need help some of the time. Uh, and it's our responsibilities as human beings to help each other, to lend a hand where, when, uh, when we meet, when we see that it's needed. Uh, in ex uh, for a few examples for blind people, um, when cross if you see a blind person at a corner waiting to cross the street, go over and ask them if they would like to take your elbow so that you can help them cross the street. It's a very, very small gesture, but I can tell you as a blind person trying to cross the street in Antigua, it makes all the difference in the world. Right? Uh, another example is that if, uh, if you see a blind person, or if you see somebody come into a dark room, uh, and they're standing there very hesitant, and they're sort of surveying the room and trying to figure out where to go, you can walk over to them and ask them if they need some help finding their table or finding their chair. And as you're walking with them, move the, uh, move the chairs that are in front of them or steer them around people. I can't tell you how many times I've collided into people in a dark room that just swear at me because they think I'm drunk. I've been thrown out of places so many times because I walk into a table or I walk into a chair and people assume that I'm drunk. Right? And we can't assume anything about people. We can't assume that they are, that they have, uh, we can't assume that they can't do something just because we see them struggling, all right? We don't know what co what's causing that struggling. With, uh, with my eyes as an example, you can't see that I can't see. And so when I get off the stage, if I fall off the stage, what are you going to think? You're going to make assumptions. But that's very, very dangerous. That's a dangerous path to go on. We need to be open-minded about everybody around us. We need to accept people around us and understand that all of us are dealing with our own things, even if we can't see what those things are. And and one uh, one last example is that right now I I can see that there are people in front of me I can't see any of your faces your I don't mean this to be mean <laughs> but your faces are all smudges uh, I can't see any definition on your faces um, and so when you see when you see me walking through the streets of Antigua um, when you see me anywhere I uh, come up but tell me your name because facial recognition for me, for any blind person, is very, very difficult. These are just some examples of small gestures that you can do. Moving chairs, uh, helping us to avoid people on the streets, saying your name when you come up to, uh, to say hi and introduce yourself. And so we need to remember that we always have to take care of each other. No person is an island. We all need to move together. We all need to, when we move together, we succeed together. And when we succeed together, we can keep reaching new heights. Here's our team at the top of Kilimanjaro. I could not have made it up there without this team. And I, I applaud every single one of them. And I hope that each one of you goes out today and, and does your own little act of kindness because it will mean the world to the person that's receiving it. Thank you.